So tell me what GraphCast is and how it differs from traditional computer models. Um, GraphCast is a state-of-the-art um, machine learning model that predicts the weather over the entire globe. Um, it is a model that is learned from 40 years of historical weather data. Um, and it predicts you know, the state of the atmosphere and the, and the weather like over the entire globe in 3Ds up to 10 days ahead. Um, the way it differs from traditional approaches is that um, it doesn't try to solve equations. Um, so traditional approaches like um, numerical weather predictions, they have those um, equations describing the state of the atmosphere and how it changes over time. And that has been studied over like many decades and it's like really rigorous science. Um, the, the, the problem with those, uh, uh, with those uh, traditional approaches is that solving those equations is extremely difficult and it requires a lot of compute to be able to solve them accurately. And the more accurate you want those predictions to be, the more compute you need to use. And so GraphCast takes a very different approach. It doesn't solve those equations at all. It just looks at um, basically pattern in historical data to learn how the weather evolves. And then once the model is trained, basically, uh, it can make extremely accurate uh, prediction, extremely fast. Um, and it's like a very different uh, paradigm in how we make weather forecasts. In the article, there's yeah. some big claims about the accuracy of this and the speed and kind of comparing it to computer models that say the National Weather Service uses or different NOAA entities here in the U.S. use. So how did you compare those and come up with that information? Yes, yeah, so the so GraphCast is a deterministic model that makes one prediction for what happens in the next 10 days. So we compared it to um, the industry gold center for deterministic forecast. Um, so that model is called HRES. It's developed by the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, or ECMWF. Um, so we compared like GraphCast to that model in an extensive study, and um, that was published in, in, in Science recently. Um, what we did is that we uh, took an approach that is uh, essentially what the ECMWF used when they compared two of their own model, when they wanted to say which one is best, uh, and they created this scorecard where they compare uh, you know, different variables at different level of altitude over different horizon of prediction. Um, and uh, essentially, they look at this matrix that describe all those, those many, many measurements, hundreds of them, thousands of them. And then when they're blue, it means the new model is better than the old ones. Um, and when it's red, it means the old one is better than the new one. So we took a similar approach where we compare graph casts to HRES on more than 1,300 measurements. Um, and what we found is that GraphCast is more accurate than HRES on 90% of them. And actually, when we look at the part of the atmosphere that is closest to the surface, um, so below 100 hectopascals, so tro basically the troposphere, we found that GraphCast outperformed HRES on more than 99% of those 1,200 measurements. What was the time period that you compared? Yes, so we, uh, we compared like forecast over 10 days. And when we <laughs> made the evaluation, we made, made the evaluation over 2018. So the question that we get very often is, okay, like, is, is GraphCast just like repeating historical pattern? Um, not really, because the way we train the model is that we always train on past data. So we, for instance, we use um, a data set called ERA5. It's a reanalysis data set from ECMWF. And uh, we train the model on data from 1979 to, for instance, 2017. So that's only past data. And then we evaluate it on 2018, which is in the future compared to the data it has seen at train time. So, um, you know, for the results we show in the paper, everything is on 2018, uh, because mostly for comparison with other methods uh, that used that year. Um, but we also have like a specific set of results for cyclone tracking. Uh, and because cyclones are like more, you know, rarer events in general, we want to have more years of, to, uh, to do the evaluation so we can show statistic, uh, statistically um, significant results. So for the CF cyclone tracking result we show in the paper, it's over four years of, of, um, of data. And we, we basically show that like uh, the model is extremely good at uh, predicting cyclone tracks, uh, and especially for uh, cyclone of category five, the most intense one. So what is GraphCast really good at? What does GraphCast struggle with? GraphCast is really good at, um, you know, predicting kind of the overall uh, weather uh, over the entire globe. And I would say like one thing that was quite surprising uh, is that it's also good at predicting uh, severe events. Um, it's not a, a model that is trained specifically to do certain tasks like cyclone tracking or characterizing atmospheric rivers. But what we saw is that after training GraphCast, when we uh, looked at the forecast, uh, we could run a tracker on top of the uh, of the forecast of GraphCast, and we could like actually accurately pinpoint like the trajectories of of cyclones. So that's something quite you know quite impressive for, for us at least, um, and uh, quite surprising in the sense that the model was not trained specifically to do good on cyclone tracks. It was just trained to predict the weather overall. Um, so cyclone tracks, 
we also characterize atmospheric rivers um, and also uh, extreme temperatures. And that's something quite interesting in the sense that some of those events are quite rare by nature. Um, and so you would expect that a method that is based on machine learning and basically statistical learning would struggle with those events that are not present very often in the data. And it turns out it's actually doing a pretty decent job. Uh, like for cyclone tracking, for instance, it's, it's more accurate than the operational, uh, the gold standard industry um, deterministic model uh, in many cases. Um, so it's quite, it's essentially like suggesting that the model is learning something quite meaningful about how the weather evolves over time. Uh, in terms of limitation, I, I would say that uh, it's a deterministic model, so it's not uh, designed really to quantify uncertainty. Um, it can, you know, you can do this typical thing of doing, um, creating an ensemble of prediction by perturbing the inputs. Uh, but I think if we want to do like a machine learning model to really tackle uncertainty, there's many, many different approaches that uh, we can take uh, and we will probably see in the near future. There's a lot of kind of fear, I think, and stigma around AI and machine learning, especially for meteorologists, um, because, you know, they read this article and they think, oh, gosh, we're being replaced. Um, so I'm curious about the role of a meteorologist in all of this and what you foresee the future being with kind of that melding of a human being doing a forecast and AI. Yeah, I don't think people should be worried about that, to be honest. I think it's quite exciting development that we're seeing. There's no one being replaced. Uh, I think the, the, w there's a few things to note. Like the first one is that the, these machine learning models they're trained on data, and they're as good as the data they're you know they're, they're trained on is right. So there's this kind of coupling between uh, the quality of the weather forecast made by AI and the data that is going to be generated, for instance, by uh, ECMWF. And that data comes from the, as a physical kind of solver or NWP in the loop, right? So that reanalysis is kind of blending observation with traditional approaches to produce really high quality data. Uh, so I think this, you know, those, those two types of approach are complementary, at least in that sense. Um, and also, I think we are just at the beginning of seeing how ML and machine learning can be applied for those problems. Um, so like those systems have, you know, strengths and weaknesses. And I think for a long time, we're going to see them being kind of side by side. Um, I, I'd say like when we talk to ECNWF and, and NOAA, they're very excited about that new type of, of technology. It's kind of a different way of approaching uh, making forecasts. And uh, they're quite enthusiastic about like, you know, having a new tool in, the, in their toolbox to, to make weather prediction and, and a new avenue to improve the forecast. I would say this is something quite interesting in the sense that uh, I think for them, it's like decoupling the compute axis, like putting more and more compute for getting better forecasts from uh, from uh, you know using more and more data and more high quality data to improve the forecast, so it's it's a very different way of thinking about uh, how to improve forecast going forward. And I think we're going to see a lot of uh, interaction between the two fields, and it's going to be quite exciting. And, and everybody's going to be benefiting from better forecasts. Um, yeah. You know, I think a lot of people think of Google as kind of a search engine <laughs> and where they get their email. So can you tell me about what Google DeepMind does? Because you're based in London. Exactly. So Google DeepMind is a part of Google. It's like a different unit within Google, and uh, it focuses really on the, the development of AI and machine learning uh, to benefit humanity. So it ranges from, you know, very fundamental paper on machine learning techniques to very applied projects. And I would say uh, DeepMind has, a, has been like over the many years, a, a strong focus on uh, applying machine learning to advance uh, make progress on scientific problems. So I think one of the, some of the kind of most famous projects developed at, at Google DeepMind or AlphaGo, uh, kind of the, the algorithm to, to play Go and that, had, you know, um, was better than the world champion at, at Go. Uh, another like really, uh, you know, very science focused effort was AlphaFold, the protein folding uh, algorithm that uh, has revolutionized uh, biology, I would say. Uh, and then, you know, we're, we're in within that long tradition of of trying to like use those new techniques to advance scientific problems that can benefit everybody. How micro scale are we talking here? Like how, um, like location wise? So uh, graphcast make prediction at 0 0.25 degree resolution, latitude longitude. So at the equator, that's roughly 28 kilometer by 28 kilometer. Um, that's mm -hmm. mostly like coming from the data we're, we're training on. And I think in the future, we'll see models that can also ingest and predict at much higher resolution. Um, I have to say that like the thing that is the most challenging uh, in 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 the problem of weather forecasting and with machine learning is the evaluation is not straightforward. It's like a very nuanced where comparing models is very nuanced. Like there's 
it's, it's, it's just a lot of things to look at. But also, I would say, like from a development point of view, the sheer size of the data that you have to deal with and process is really challenging. And I think that's where a lot of effort is going. Like, for instance, in GraphCast to scale, what we say, scale the model to high resolution. Uh, that's that's really challenging. And I think, uh, you know, in the near future, we'll see like more investment in engineering to make those models work at even higher resolution. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're just at the beginning. 